Hello, I am Ferris Pilot, and I absolutely love tactical turn-based games. There's something special about carefully outmaneuvering the opponent and outwitting them to attain victory. That's why today I'm talking to somebody who has a ton of experience making games like that. And this is Julian Gollop. He's the creator of XCOM UFO Defense, and he's currently kickstarting Chaos Reborn, another game of the genre that's a successor to one of his first games of all time, Chaos the Battle of Wizards. Julian, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. All right, I'm just going to jump right in. You have a lot of experience in the industry, a lot of experience making games. So what do you think is the most important thing you've learned? Now, that's a real toughie to start with, for sure. Um, <laughs> the, the most important thing I've learned is that you've got to try and stay true to your vision of what you're trying to do and trying to create. But you need to be prepared to be flexible because when you create something, you've got to test it. You've got to expose it to people. You've got to get feedback. And uh, you can't be precious about your creation. You have got to let it hang out there. And this can improve what you do enormously. And perhaps the second thing that's related to that is that you really have to try to prototype your uh, game as soon as possible and try and get the core gameplay in it uh, and testable. Uh, you need to basically find the fun very quickly because you can't really afford to go too far and, and, and have to make big game design changes at later stages of development. Right. So actually, I think you mentioned that in your talk at GDC last year about XCOM. Yeah. Um, well, XCOM, XCOM itself, you have to remember, was an evolution from a number of games that I worked on before. Uh, going all the way back to 1984 with a game called Rebel Star Raiders, which was just a two-player game on a single screen at a ZX Spectrum. Uh, and then I made a game called Laser Squad, uh, and uh, sorry, Rebel Star, and then Laser Squad. These are basically following on from these the, the theme of, of uh, tactical turn-based gameplay, which became the core of, of XCOM. But of course, XCOM added something much bigger as well. Do you think we'll see something uh, outside of that core tactical gameplay also in Chaos Reborn? Yes, there is. There's an interesting metagame in Chaos Reborn, and it revolves around um, several things. One is the single-player game, which is where you're exploring these realms of chaos. Uh, and it has a strong online component because there's a, a co-op play involved there that you can invite players to help you in your realm in some of the difficult battles. And you can find equipment and artifacts in these realms, which you can use uh, to um, buff up your wizard and make your wizard um, more powerful in combination with certain spells. Uh, but then again, this is connected to the multiplayer as well, because a lot of the multiplayer modes allow the use of equipment. And uh, you can use that to, to help you in your multiplayer battles. And then there are also guilds. If you join a guild, then you can exchange and trade equipment with other players in the guild, and you can trade um, maps and other artifacts that you get from the realms to, to help your, your other guild members uh, do well in single player as well. So, yeah, there is, there is more of a, yeah, there's more of a meta game than just a, just a simple arena battle, for sure. Sure, and... While we're talking about Chaos Reborn, it's obviously based on the original game Chaos. And how much would you say is based on the original and how much is uh, new material? Well, what I did is look at the core mechanics of Chaos. And they're very simple, and but they work beautifully. So I decided, well, look, I'm going to take these more or less as it is. I'm not going to mess with that formula because it works so well. And then I decided how to... Um, create even more game variety and interest in the game. The first thing I did was um, devise a, uh, a terrain system. So the original game just had a, a completely blank, black arena. And it was filled with spells and gooey blobs and trees and fires and everything. Um, but the Chaos Reborn, we now got procedurally generated uh, environments based on different environment types like mountains, forests, ruins, caves, citadels, you name it. And it will generate different terrain. And the terrain has different levels of elevation, which is uh, a big factor in the tactical gameplay. Uh, and it has um, you know, obstacles, like, you know, trees and, and rocks, and some interactive terrain elements as well. We'll have um, uh, shrines where you can worship uh, uh, your god and get bonuses. 
Um, there'll be pickups like uh, different types of chests with scrolls in them and so on. So there'll be, there'll be a lot more, if you like, content in just the environment. And um, that, that still, you know, still has the core mechanics of, of chaos. Um, we've also added, as I mentioned before, the, the equipment system. The equipment has a generally special bonuses and powers, but your wizard staff, which is your main item of equipment, has a particular special ability. And it, you know, it, it can do something um, like a powerful spell, for example. Um, and above that, um, above and beyond that, um, we've also got a number of different game modes as well. So different types of multiplayer game modes and co-op versus AI and so on. So other than the original Chaos, what would you say are the biggest influences on Chaos Reborn? I guess it goes back to my board game playing days uh, in the very early 80s. Um, it's interestingly, the original Chaos World was based on the board game that I made in around about 1982, mm-hmm. which in turn was inspired by a Games Workshop uh, board game called Warlock. And I was uh, never allowed to play this game at school. There was a group of kids who used to play this. I had to watch them because they wouldn't let me play. And I thought, well, Heck, you know, if they're not going to let me join in this game, I'm going to make my own wizard game, and it's going to be better than this one. <laughs> uh, and that's that's how that was the evolution of the original chaos. So I have a lot of influence from, uh, I guess, you know, just the role-playing games that I was playing. Obviously, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons was a big thing in my life in 1979, 1980. Uh, various other role-playing games, even science fiction ones like Travel and stuff, and all these systems that were were involved in in um, board games were the main these were the main influence between behind chaos and other, and other games that I've made. How about some of the past games that you've worked on yourself? Uh, what before chaos or or uh, before or after? Yeah, influences on um, well, some of the games that I've worked on are uh, quite original. I mean the first game that I designed was called Time Lords, which is about. Uh, Travel in space, altering the course of history, uh, it was kind of quite original. That was a multiplayer game only. Um, but when I when I made um, Rebel Star Raiders, as it was called, this two-player tactical game, uh, it was very popular with players, even though it was two-player only. And I kind of that's where I saw um, something that could be evolved and uh, improved over time. You know, with Rebel Star, I had like a scrolling map, and I had uh, you know, this opportunity fire system and morale thrown in. Um, when I got to Laser Squad, I added, you know, hidden uh, units. So, you know, I had a line of sight system, so you couldn't see the enemy unless your 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 characters, your soldiers, had you know, a direct line of sight to the, mm-hmm. the enemy characters, uh, and had explosives and uh, chain reaction explosions and so on. So, you know, by that stage, that was a real evolution and influence in what what I was doing later on with, with XCOM. So it's really just an evolution over time. Yeah, it was. I mean, with Chaos also, I, I evolved it. Um, I, I did a, a sort of a sequel called Lords of Chaos, which again uh, was much more RPG-focused and much more slow playing. Um, and I, I also revisited the the magic theme with a, a later game that I made, uh, which was published in 1998, called Magic and Mayhem. Uh, interestingly, that was an RTS-style game. I mean, real-time game, and it. But it still featured, you know, even some of the spells from the original Chaos, like the GUI Blob, for example, <laughs> was was in Magic and Mayhem. So you've been mentioning these spells a lot. Could you tell us about what kinds of spells we can expect in Chaos Reborn, especially any unusual or really cool ones? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, a lot of the spells are creature summoning spells, and you know this kind of is 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 the base of of your army and what you can do in Chaos Reborn. But there are a number of spells which are kind of a little bit weird and wonderful, and they work in conjunction with your other spells. I mean, I mentioned the GUI Blob, for example, that is going to make a reappearance in in Chaos Reborn, and you summon a GUI Blob. You can summon it directly on on an enemy creature, and it will spread. It will engulf enemy creatures and stop them moving. You don't control where it moves. It's kind of a bit of a chaotic spell. Uh, but, you oh, know, um, blob... just sorry to interrupt, but does it also yeah. affect your own creatures or just the enemies? No, no, it won't spread on your own creatures. That's the, the one good thing. So it'll only spread onto enemy creatures and it will attack them as well. Um, and the, you know, 
the enemy can can try and free his creatures from the greebill by attacking them, but you know the, the spreading ability is is, is quite uh, quite uh, awesome <laughs> when you have to face it. Um, so that's going to make an appearance, and and it's some spells like that which kind of made chaos a really interesting and you know diverse experience. And we've got, also got magic fire which spreads as well in a slightly different way to to the chaos blobs. Hmm. Um, and we've got some some spells also reappearing again, like the uh, Shadowwood, which is in the current prototype, where you create a sort of little forest of trees, which are um, able to attack enemies. And they <laughs> can't move, but they can attack. So they can create like a like a defensive zone, if you like. So it's difficult for for your uh, enemy creatures to to uh, sort of penetrate it. Um, there's, a, there's also a spell called Magic Wood. Now this is an interesting one because it's one that works quite well with co-op. That you again, you're summoning a a little um, group of trees, a little wood, if you like. Um, your wizard may enter the enter a tree and gain protection by being inside this magical tree. And there is a random chance that the that the tree may may grant your wizard uh, an extra spell. In which case, the tree then gets used up and disappears, but you've got an extra spell. And if you're you know playing co-op, your uh, teammate can also make use of your your magic wood. And it's also the way to get uh, some, some spells which you can't otherwise get, called the uh, turmoil spell. Uh, turmoil spell is one that just randomly replaces, you sort of moves everything around in the arena uh, completely chaotically. <laughs> uh, it's a spell of last resort, I know, but it can it can change the situation when you need it. And some of the you know new spells that I'm experimenting with are ones which have you know interesting effects and synergies with other spells uh, and that are really positional and uh, uh, require you to think uh, carefully about what you're doing um, for example plague is an interesting one if you cast a plague on an enemy creature it will infect adjacent creatures and one's adjacent to them and one's adjacent to them so you can imagine all the Creatures connected in a chain of connection will suddenly get infle- infected with this this plague. So you need to take advantage of, of positions of enemy creatures in order to do that. And you don't want to infect your own creatures as well. So that's the other thing to watch out for. Uh, and a plague can can kill creatures, and you know, the creatures will remain infected in, until they until they can um, get rid of it through their own magic resistance. And another one which is interesting, for example, is um, Fountain of Life. When you summon this, it summons like this object, this Fountain of Life, and uh, it means that you know the next three creatures of yours which die, or even your wizard, for example, will be resurrected next to the Fountain of Life. So it gives you uh, a bit of a saving grace there um, from some of the combat, especially if you want to get your wizard involved in combat, it will get resurrected. But the downside, of course, is that the the fountain of life itself can be attacked by the enemy, so you need to keep it safe, or you need to keep it mm-hmm. out of the way, or hidden, or protected in some way. So you need to use that in conjunction with other spells. So there are a few examples. Uh, that was great. I was actually going to ask you how you retain tactical depth without having matches that go on forever, but I mean, with <laughs> that variety of spells, uh, anything to add? Yeah, the variety of spells does does make a, a lot of difference, and there are spells which probably are more offensive and those which are more defensive it depends what you need in any current situation and um but to win you you do have to attack i mean if you're ahead in victory points then yes you can um hunker down a little bit and you know your enemy is opposed uh, your enemy is obliged to attack them but you know he could easily overtake in victory points by killing some of your creatures so you have to be you know very careful um and the game is is tense until the end you, you're not there's no it's very rare for there to be a guaranteed victor early on in the game. And could you tell us a little bit about just the very basic of the gameplay, like what the ultimate goal is? Sorry. Sure, yeah, yeah, the actual basics of the gameplay. So you control a wizard character, and you enter an arena with other wizards, and all you have to start with is your selection of spells. Um, many of these spells are creature summoning spells, so you use those to summon a creature. Uh, each spell has a percentage chance to to be cast. Uh, so a simple spell, an easy spell would be like the goblin at 90 percent, and a, a really difficult spell would be uh, you know like gold dragon at twenty percent. Um, but there are several things you can do to to influence this. So one of them is to shift the balance of 
law and chaos. So as you cast law spells, they become easier to cast. And as you cast chaos spells, they would become easier to cast. And it shifts between law and chaos that way. So a good strategy would be, for example, if you've got, uh, you know, a really nice uh, chaos spell like a red dragon. um, And you've also got a few easy to cast, maybe cheap chaos spells like uh, like goblin or a zombie. Then you start trying to push towards chaos with your goblins and zombies. And then once once chaos is getting a big bonus, then you try to try to summon your your red dragon. Uh, and kind of almost linked to that strategy is also the ability to summon creatures as illusions. So if you summon a creature as an illusion, it has a 100% chance of being cast. But uh, your enemy wizards have disbelief spell, which can be used to dispel an illusion. Uh, otherwise, an illusion acts and behaves like a, a real creature. So you can be moving your illusions around and fighting with them and so on. Until the point your enemy wizards decide, aha, you know, I think that might be an illusion. You might be bluffing there. So there's an interesting game of bluff and deception there. Uh, but even going back to the early example of the Lawn Chaos, for example, you know, if you wanted to summon that, uh, that red dragon, you could use a lot of Chaos Illusion creatures just to try and boost the Chaos rating uh, and not worry too much about those being disbelieved, for example. That's, that's a valid strategy. Um, so the, these elements all come into play. I'll probably explain the most complicated parts of the game, but basically you're, you, know, you have... Uh, a bunch of creatures you wizard you, you move each creature and you can attack with them and it's strictly turn based so you take your turn with all your creatures and when you turn then the enemy takes his turn <laughs> and your wizard can move and he can attack you or he can cast a spell each turn and the ultimate goal is to just defeat the enemy wizard that's right yes yes all right uh in your XCOM postmortem at gdc last year you mentioned your philosophy on game design i'll just read it out it's only a couple of sentences Sure. A game should have a life of its own such that it repeatedly generates experiences that are fresh and engaging. The actors in this system should appear to be intelligent and responsive to the player's actions. How do you achieve that in, in your games, especially Chaos Reborn? Well, it is achieved with uh, some interesting AI programming and uh, also to try and make sure that AI is, is, is not predictable. We try and... Um, give some random elements to the AI, but not completely random. They have they exist within certain rule sets. Um, so, for example, if in Chaos Reborn, an enemy wizard might have a particular personality where he's, he's very re- aggressive and he likes to use um, direct attack spells like Magic Bolt and he likes to ride a mount and get into conflict. So we can give the wizard that personality, but at the same time, he still has to do things intelligently. So if he is in danger, then he does have to retreat and protect mm-hmm. himself. Um, if he if he is ahead on victory points, then again, he might he might change his strategy and, and go back to being start being defensive again and try and retreat. So again, you have to put these, uh, uh, even given random elements in there, they have to have some measure of intelligence. Mm-hmm. And the player has to uh, kind of appreciate in a way what the AI is doing, even if the player doesn't, you know, can't fully predict what the enemy is doing. What the enemy does should it still make some kind of sense, if you see what I mean. So, I mean, this is quite difficult to achieve in, in um, strategy games or, in fact, any game that uses AI. So it's, um, but it is a key part of, of making the experience fresh and interesting for the player. So is it just really a matter of polishing the game and then trying out, seeing what works and what doesn't? Not exactly. I mean, for, for example, what we'll do is we'll have several parameters that can alter, that, that can define, if you like, a personality for, for a wizard. Mm-hmm. And these personalities will uh, be based on, on certain kinds of strategies or, you know, aggression, defensive uh, prefers law, prefers chaos, and that kind of thing. And um, and the players should recognise that when they're playing different wizards, that that they do have different, if you like, uh, tactical personalities, and they aren't always going to behave the same way in the same situation. Um, so it requires a little bit of planning, and you're right, it does require a hell of a lot of testing as well. Right. So, kind of leading into this, what can we expect out of the single player campaign? And how long do you expect it to be? 
Well, it's kind of a, um, I wouldn't say necessarily infinite, but it could be if the player wants it to be. But what you start with is, is a wizard who's level one, uh, and you have a leveling system, and you explore these realms of chaos, and each day you will have um, potentially uh, a small handful, a small selection of, of, of new realms that you could explore, uh, and you enter these these realms and have different uh, you know there's different regions in these realms of you know mountains towns cities uh, forests and so on you you explore it and you um, and you acquire artifacts and equipment you fight enemies and so on and uh, but each realm has a basically a similar objective and that's to defeat the ruler of that realm you know ultimately you know the ultimate ruler of it the the wizard king. But they're procedurally generated. This is the other thing, and um, you know, it's a lot of procedural generation in the game. Uh, and each realm has a level as well. And as your wizard level increases, this allows you access to higher level realms. And higher level realms have um, obviously more nastier uh, AI controlled wizards, but they'll have also some more interesting artifacts, and there might be more rare spells that you could find there as well because you're as you're going along you're sort of building up your spells library uh, by acquiring spell books um and this this is basically the single player version of the game it's it's kind of rpg based with this this random content i mean i guess maybe slightly remin reminiscent of how some you know multi-user dungeons are created or, or roguelike games that you know you've got this um uh you know each time you enter a realm it's probably going to be something slightly different <laughs> Um, so as your wizard progresses, you can you can level up your wizard, and um, you know, ultimately you become pretty powerful. So against there's probably you know there's going to be a level cap at some point, and you become the most powerful. You know, become very powerful. And that would be that could be the end of the single player game for you if you wanted. But uh, you know connected with that, we also have uh, other interesting aspects of the game, which are these feudal like ranks. Um, so you can at some point become a wizard lord, and that would mean that you can place your character inside realms for other people to encounter, <laughs> and it would be AI controlled. It'll be you be doing this offline, so you might have you know quite a few battles um, uh, offline before you come back online and check how your wizard is done. And if you do reasonably well at that, it can qualify you to become a wizard king. And a wizard king, of course, rules over a realm, and you your uh, wizard will be used in realms for you know to populate uh the the realm with um you know wizard king and so forth but also you can create your own realm so there's a realm creation tool there's a little bit of uh and you can create realms which are interesting contain some puzzle elements and, and story elements if you wish and the idea is to to make realms which are, are interesting and fun for other players because they will rate your realm and if you do well at that then you could be qualified for becoming a demigod and now as a demigod, you um, control one of the guilds, one of the powerful guilds in the in the game. And now your objective is to recruit members to your guild. Well, the first thing you have to do is declare your loyalty to one of the gods. Um, and that god can help you and assist you in your tasks. Uh, and you build a guild and your, your aim is to get the guild rankings <clears throat> high. And if you do well at that, then you might qualify to become a god. Uh, and if you are a god, then you have the power to bestow blessings and favors on your followers, and you need to attract followers and worshippers to to give you the power to to do this. Um, so that's that. I guess you could say the ultimate objective might might be for a player to become a god and and to rule over the, the 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 world of the realms of chaos. And that also ties into the multiplayer, right? It does tie into the multiplayer as well. So in multiplayer, you, you've got um, uh, you've got a ranked matching system mode, which is uh, you'll be players will be placed into into sort of like lead divisions or possibly subdivisions if there's a large number of players, and you can challenge anybody within your division, and you need to improve your rating. It's like an LO, based on an LO rating system, mm -hmm. uh, as many games use, and you have to try and progress your division and improve your multiplayer rankings. And these these rankings can um, help with your guild ranking if you're a member of a guild. It can also help to for you to be qualified to 
become a wizard lord, for example, or even a wizard king, and so on. So these these multiplayer rankings can help you in your uh, progression of the feudal rank. And um, there are uh, yeah, there are also different. You know, there's also non-ranked multiplayer modes. In some modes, you can use your equipment. Some modes are much more symmetrical and even, or you know, like the naked wizard mode where you don't have equipment. Uh, there's a mode where each player has uh, is given a random selection of spells, but they're the same selection, and you have to discard a third of them. So when you go into battle, uh, the wizards will have different selection of spells, but you've you've selected them from a from a known set. Um, that's called the symmetrical mode, mm-hmm. and that that is is basically basically it. I mean, you can. When you, you can, a wizard can gain experience and you can also level up through multiplayer gaming. You don't have to do the single player game to do that. So that's that's another avenue for players. And how how do you make it so that you can have a wide variety of character builds in online combat, not just one build that's really overpowered compared to the rest? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the the wizards say so the wizards' power, a uh, leveling power, allows him to level up his equipment. But the and the, and the equipment does improve. Uh, in its uh, in its power and ability for sure. I mean, it's but it's not absolutely decisive. You know, you can still fight a high level wizard being a low level wizard. But the actual player matching, the actual matching system, the game matching system, will tend to make sure that wizards are roughly in um, in the same level of um, power in terms of their level, uh, as well as it, as well as their ranking. Um, but the other thing is that if you're in a, a multiplayer battle and you you are a higher level wizard, you are also a high level target because there's a lot more you get a lot more experience points for killing mm-hmm. higher level wizards than lower level wizards, um, and, and more victory points as well. So you kind of um, there's kind of a little bit of a balancing system in there already. All right, so. Moving on, what kinds of realms and areas can we expect in terms of what types of terrain and what kind of natural obstacles there will be in them? Right, well, the basic ones, you've got um, forests, which tend to be populated with trees. So occasionally they might have rivers and water areas as well. And you've got mountains, which are much more rough, uneven terrain with uh, crevices and um, you know, lots of variation in the terrain levels. Um, you've got plains, which are much more plain of course um, and you've got towns which again maybe have buildings and other elements in them which are you know uh, area, like bits of furniture and stuff like that um, caves which are tunnels and and uh, caverns more confined uh, and the citadels which is where the the, the wizard kings resigned um, Again, there's more architectural style, and there's ruins. So, they they all have the different visual style and, and a different way of you know a different style of uh, gameplay attached to them because of the way the maps are generated. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about how they affect gameplay? Um, yes, I can tell you some things, but then not everything has been decided yet. And and the mountainous <laughs> ones, for example. Would, would would probably benefit flying creatures more because it may be more difficult for um, the ground creatures to to move around in that type type of environment. Um, forest zone will probably um, favour uh, powerful ground creatures that can can fight their way through trees because the trees can also be removed and you know other spells mm-hmm. like magic fire can burn the woods down. So the, these interactions are are also important. Uh, the runes can um, can contain shrines, which I, I mentioned before, which you can use to um, make a sacrifice to your god to gain a benefit in battle. Um, citadels will contain uh, citadels and towns will typically also contain other pickups, which are important, which are the, uh, chests, which may contain anything from gold to artifacts to special spell scrolls, which have one-off effects and um, so on. So. There's there's a lot of stuff there, uh, and not all of it's been determined yet. Of course, the game's still under development. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what what made you decide to return to the Chaos series? Mainly because so many people have 
have made uh, clones of it. I know there's about 35 clones made already. I was getting requests from people to, you know, ask my permission to to make clones. And I, I kind of thought that there really must be something about this game which is so enduring because there's been nothing like it since. And, you know, the original had this interesting balance between simplicity and tactics and fun, which... Um, is is really quite difficult to do in in turn based gaming. So uh, I, I I think it has you know a lot of potential in in terms of being brought to a, to a new audience with with also um, you know the new multiplayer modes and and so on, which is um, I think will will add to the to the depth of the game, but still keep the you know the simple quick fun of the original. You're right. Yeah. Especially, I, I find the illusion part really interesting. I don't think any other game yes. has done that. I don't, not to my knowledge, no, no. So um, just to round us off here, what's your experience been like with Kickstarter so far, and would it be something you'd consider doing again in the future? Well, the experience is, uh, is quite nerve-wracking because you have to do a hell of a lot to, to try and keep the momentum behind the campaign and making people aware of it. So I would say it's very difficult. Be prepared to lose a lot of sleep. Uh, would I do it again? Well, certainly not immediately. I would <laughs> uh, I would certainly like to take a rest before I even attempted it again. Um, so it's... Uh, it's very interesting. It's very encouraging. We get, I, I get a good response from people backing it. Lots of interesting questions, some difficult questions as well. So I think it really helps build the relationship between the developer and the you know your potential customers, your players, and your backers, um, which is an experience that will be difficult to find elsewhere. I think. All right. Thank you very much for the interview, Julian. Thank you. All right, and to my viewers, I'd like to say I'll post a link to the Kickstarter page in the video description, and be sure to check it out if you thought it was interesting. I'm certainly interested. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.